coming up. But in terms of how indie films are actually financed, made, and distributed, we're still clinging on to the fumes of a 90s model that barely worked even then. It's just not working for anybody except like 10 people. And the Duplass brothers are two of them. <laughs> Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make a micro-budget feature, submit your film or screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. This series exists in both video and podcast form, and is designed to be experienced either way. You can find the video version at moviemaker.com, or the audio version wherever you get your podcasts. From Studio Fest and Movie Maker Magazine, this is Demystified, a series about an innovative new way to make movies, and what it really takes to make an indie feature film. My name is Jake Bowen, and this series is about shedding light on the parts of getting an indie film made that are never seen and rarely talked about through the lens of Studio Fest, a one of a kind annual film festival that awards up and coming writers and directors the chance to make a feature film. In our tireless quest to demystify the arcane world of indie film, we've had the privilege of talking to a number of great filmmakers and writers about their experiences. But Naomi McDougall Jones may just have the most comprehensive experience of the system as it exists today of anyone we've talked to so far. She's been through traditional distribution with her first film, self-distribution with her second, and uniquely, she co-founded a film fund that gives her insight into the world of serious indie film financing. And now she has some hard truths to share about the reality of our current paradigm. She's also the author of the book, The Wrong Kind of Women, Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood. So, here's Charles Beale's conversation with writer, actor, author, and activist, Naomi McDougall Jones. I started off as an actress, got out of acting school, got very quickly disillusioned with the roles available for women, decided I could write better roles for women than what I was seeing, uh, so made my first feature film with um, producer Caitlin Gold and Joanna Bowser called Imagine I'm Beautiful, which we made for $80,000. We didn't know anything, nobody knew us. <laughs> we scrapped it together, um, but we made the film and it got theatrical release and it got distribution deal, which, I mean, we felt like Cinderella. And then we learned about indie film distribution, <laughs> the realities of indie film distribution. We were offered this distribution deal by a boutique, a new boutique distribution company at the time, this was 2014, called Candy Factory Films. And at that time, we knew nothing, really. None of us had been to film school. We'd all been to acting school. I mean, we were really f figuring out this filmmaking thing, like, you know, just dealing with the problem immediately in front of us. But even in that position, we did the math and figured that probably it would we would make more money if we self-distributed that film. But at the time, that film was everybody's calling card. It was everybody's first feature. And what we knew and what our investors were kind enough to agree to was that even though that was the case, we really needed to be able to say that we got a theatrical distribution deal if we could. So we took the deal and Candy Factory did a reasonably good job. <laughs> like they were honest. They always sent us quarterly reports. They always picked up our phone calls. I mean, like for a distributor, that's actually a pretty high bar in the world <laughs> of distributors. Now, I think we made slightly under $5,000. I think we received from them slightly under $5,000 over the course of the time that they had it, which is not great. Even on an $80,000 film, not great. Um, then they went bankrupt. I think they actually didn't go bankrupt. I think they dissolved themselves before that happened, but they closed the company. But we, we still had a contract with them. And luckily we hadn't signed that long a contract. I think it was five or six years, but it was still two to three years before the end of our contract when they went under. So then they sold their library to a different distribution company. And this is where filmmakers have to be so careful because distribution companies are popping in and out of existence like popcorn. <laughs> uh, if a distribution company lasts more than three years, it is an absolute miracle. And so when a distribution company goes under, and it is usually a when, there are a number of very crazy things that can happen. So we got the least crazy version of this, which is that they just sold their library to this other distributor. But we didn't get any say in who that distributor was, of course. The distributor didn't really care very much about I mean, they were just buying like a library of content. So they weren't that invested in us. But in 
crazier circumstances, if your distribution company actually goes bankrupt, you can end up in a situation where the whole company goes into court and the revenue from your film can actually be assigned by the court to a creditor. So you could get an, end up in a situation where the revenue from your film is being paid directly to that distributor's biggest creditor for the rest of your contract and there's nothing that's that's legal there's nothing you can do about that if you can get in your distribution contract a clause about what happens if the distribution company goes under that's a very important thing to try to do which we didn't know and i think most filmmakers don't know so then that second distribution company never returned my emails never sent us a report never sent us a check i had a calendar reminder on my phone i emailed them once a month for two years <laughs> I called them nothing. One week I began getting screenshots from friends all over the country being like, oh my God, your film's on, te on my local television. And it's my film and I'm like, what the f is going on? So I send the screenshots to this distribution company. Finally, they're like, oh yeah, good news. We sold your film for a TV deal. Uh, okay, here's a check for that. And it was like 3000 bucks, which was something. And then they've gone back to not responding to us. <laughs> My God, that's horrendous. As far as I know, the fact that you even knew where your film ended up is, is still a miracle. Totally. There were a lot of things we'd been told about Imagine I'm Beautiful as to why we didn't make money. So it's about two women. Um, it's a drama. <laughs> if you've been watching since episode one, take a drink. The women thing we were told many times, which I, I was not going to buy into that premise. But, you know, it's a small film. We didn't have any name cast, but blah, 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 blah. the budget was too small. So we, we corrected for a lot of that on Bite Me. So my second feature film, Bite Me, which we made for $500,000. It's a subversive romantic comedy about a real life vampire and the IRS agent who audits her. I thought that maybe you liked me, which was stupid, obviously. I do. I do like you. No, you don't. That first night, it was so real. It was like I knew something about you, about us. I only just met you. I know, I wasn't gonna say anything because I didn't want to sound like some lunatic stalker person. You know what, I don't care. I want to be your lunatic stalker person. So, funny, fun, you know, niche groups, four weirdos, which I use in the most loving and <laughs> inclusive sense. And we had some name cast, like not household names, but we were really smart about it. So we knew that people who loved Harry Potter were probably going to love Bite Me because it's like a similar nerdy vein. And the Harry Potter generation was like the right age for the film. So we got Christian Coulson, who played Tom Riddle in the Harry Potter movies, to play the male lead. And we got Naomi Grossman, who, who was this cult favorite Pepper from American Horror Story. We got Annie Golden, who's like a legend, but probably most famous for Orange is the New Black. And so she had the sort of edgy feminist audience. So we cast people who not everybody who would know what they were, who they were, but the people who loved those people, we were pretty confident would love Bite Me. So that was our approach to casting. And we had a bigger budget. We had a half million dollar budget. And we made a really great film. And when we started talking to distributors, we started hearing the same old excuses like, oh my God, we love this film so much. 10 years ago, this would have been a giant hit, but we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to market this film. Blah, 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 blah. And we were like, we made a romantic comedy about vampires. What are you talking about? You don't know how to market this. This film markets itself. What are you talking about? So a couple of months into these conversations, my producing partner, Sarah Wharton, and I looked at each other and we're like, we're, we can't do this again. Like, we can't just keep throwing our films into a system that keeps not working. Like, that's the definition of insanity. <laughs> we can't do this again. So we're like, okay, we know who our audience is. We know literally where they live. We've done all this work building up this email list. We're just going to distribute this film ourselves. And so we launched the Joyful Vampire Tour of America. So we rented an RV for three months. We drove 13,001 miles around the country and we did 51 screenings in 40 cities in 90 days, which was bad shit, but amazing. And the screenings weren't just screen screenings, they were experiences. So we invited audience members to come in costume. We were in costume. After every screening, we had a joyful vampire ball, um, which was like kind of part costume party, part um, like let your freak flag fly event slash like hang out with the filmmakers. 
we sold merchandise, we sold DVDs, sweatshirts and t-shirts and posters and bite me pins. We upcharged sometimes for the balls We and, and we set the ticket price according to the city it was in. Like if it was in a wealthier place, the tickets would cost more. If it wasn't, they would cost less. We made a significant amount of money on merchandise. And we made more money in the first week of ticket sales alone on tour than I had made for my entire first film through a distributor. Our hope with the tour was that the in-person screenings would drive online sales. So we had it on TVOD platforms in the US during, at the same time. That did not pan out at all. By the way, TVOD stands for Transactional Video On Demand, platforms like Google Play and iTunes. As far as subscription video on demand, like Netflix and Hulu. So we made money from the tour. We made money from merchandise and tickets and all these things. We did not make money on TVOD, which I think was like the summer that it collapsed because everybody had moved on to SVOD, basically. So we did not make our money back on the film because we were relying on this two-tier model. So since then, we've been on this extended journey to try to figure out how do you make more money after that. Um, and COVID was very hard. It was a very hard year in that way because the whole market froze basically. But we've just started working with this international sales company that has a, a strictly digital model, but globally. Uh, it's called Under the Milky Way. They're a very interesting company. And um, so during the Joyful Vampire Tour of America, we made a docu-series that's available on YouTube called the Joyful Vampire Tour of America the docuseries, and every week through the entire tour, we released a 15 to 20 minute video about the tour and releasing all of our data. So we were fully transparent, like this is how many tickets we sold this week, this is how much money we made, this is how much merch we sold, all of these things. We're gonna pick that back up again in October as we're releasing this film globally internationally because Under the Milky Way has an immediate feedback platform in terms of sales. So we're gonna try all these different marketing strategies of like, to try to answer the question, how do you get people to buy a film on the internet? <laughs> Just like the question. So we're gonna try all these different techniques and in real time reveal all of our data in terms of what we're doing and also what the results are. Um, so if people are interested, they can, we're gonna continue on that same YouTube channel. So my estimates for the way that this will break down is that we will make about $35,000 in ticket sales from the tour. We will make I highly recommend you check out the Joyful Vampire Tour of America series on YouTube. It's an incredible resource for anyone who's planning to make a film, and I don't think you'll find filmmakers more transparent with their data than Naomi and her colleagues. I mean, let's just talk about the structure of sales companies and distribution companies, even if they're not being predatory. I mean, just like the way that business is done is that the sales or distribution company takes their expenses off the top in almost every situation. So, you know, from earned revenue, they're paying for all of their costs first, and then you get revenue, which is insane. Because if you if you ask them this, they'll say, well, it's the cost of doing business. We, we, we have to protect ourselves. We have to cover the cost of doing business. But our cost of doing a business is a lot higher. Right. And why should we take all of the risk and they take none of the risk, and we're the ones who are actually making, like they couldn't exist without us actually. And there's less incentive. If they're making their salaries off of recouping first expenses, there's no incentive to actually get beyond that. Sure, I think that the the carrot ends up being, you know, you're gonna see this percentage of every dollar, but they paid themselves enough to survive already by that point. Right, and none of them are playing for, uh, and I, when I say none of them, I mean like distributors that true indie filmmakers are dealing with, not A24 and like those, right. but, but the distributors that we're talking about here, they're playing a pennies game across a lot of films. So as long as they recoup their costs and they don't really care if they make more than that. I think another problem is silence, which I totally understand. Like there are reasons why people don't want to say things or call people out, but but I think the other thing that happens is that everybody gets continually screwed over and then is afraid to reveal publicly how screwed over they got because they don't want to look stupid also. And they don't want to because because there's this mythology that like people are making money on indie films. And so then you don't want to say out loud that you're the schmo who didn't make any money. But I think the reality is that everybody's getting screwed and nobody's making money. And we have to start saying that out loud. 
that specifically, I think like behind the curtain, we're gonna we're learning that nobody's making money on indie films except for these big aggregates or the end users or the person who has the company that has the direct relationship with the exhibitor. Right. Um, the middleman. The middleman. Okay, that all may be true, but clearly some indie films are being financed and distributed and turning a profit each year, right? How do we square that? Well, this is where Naomi's experience with film financing comes in. So the 51 Fund is a private equity fund dedicated to financing films by female filmmakers um, that I co-founded along with three other co-founders, Lois Scott, who's the former CFO of the city of Chicago, Caitlin Gold, who uh, works in distribution, worked for Lionsgate, and Lindsay Lanzalotta, who's a very highly award-winning independent film producer. This came out of my women in film activism work and the recognition that women's films are chronically underfunded because there's this refrain that was never true, but is still spouted that films that they don't make money, right? That the reason that we have to keep making films by and about men is that they just, that's what makes money. And that's just the data does not remotely show this. But we want to be a living example to say, like, you can fund these films and make money. But it's also given me a really interesting lens into distribution and financing that I could not have gotten as a filmmaker, because it's sort of on the other side of the veil. So as a film fund, our entire goal is to demonstrate that films by and about women make money. And we're dealing with many millions of dollars. So, you know, this we have to be a serious film investment fund. We have to make money. So how do you do that? <laughs> and here's what's interesting. The only way to actually make real money on indie films right now is through a very small set of distributors. Either the streamers buy it directly, right? So Netflix, Hulu, uh, Showtime, like these, either you sell it directly like that, or you're talking about A24, Neon, Bleecker Street, very small number of high level distribution companies. Okay, well, how do you actually make those sales? Basically the system, the Hollywood system has to choose you because they've got those connections wrapped up more or less. But the system chooses a film not when it's finished, it chooses a film at the script stage, which as an investor is fantastic because when we get a project, we know at the script stage, 90% whether that film's gonna be in Sundance and whether it's gonna make money at the script stage. So basically these projects are getting on elevators that they're riding directly to the top floor, which as an investor is wonderful because there's almost no risk <laughs> Uh, because instead of trying us having to try to guess what audiences actually want to see, that's actually irrelevant to us. All we have to know is has the industry, has, has WME, has CAA, has Sundance already selected this film for success? Because if they have, it's going to sell and it's going to make us money. But what filmmakers don't understand and the mythology that's sold to filmmakers is that you can somehow get on that elevator later. That, you, that once you've finished your film, you can get on that elevator that, you know, if you're in production, you can get on, and that is not the case 95% of the time. And that's really important for us to know because that also means that we don't actually have independent film, right? Because in order to succeed, the system has to pick you, <laughs> which fundamentally is not independent. So we don't have an independent film system. We need to create one making it so that some somebody who is out there self-financing has the ability to uh, make a profit and hopefully make another movie afterward that's the key to to creating that that sector which doesn't exist right no it, and it doesn't exist because there's no sustainability right now to your point that could i don't know what that looks like yet i mean maybe it means that we somehow find a way to get audiences to pay enough to make it sustainable financially or does it mean that we say, you know what, independent film is like theater. You can't make money at it and we're gonna turn it into a nonprofit model. Does it mean getting um, companies to use actually ad dollars to pay for films and they don't care about a financial ROI, they care about a eyeball ROI. But I think we have to be open to all of those possibilities because maybe the investment structure is the wrong structure for independent film. I don't know, I'm not saying that. I just, that these are the things we're exploring in Constellation Incubator. 
one of the things I'm working on, I co-founded Constellation Incubator this summer, which is we've taken 60 filmmakers and are in the middle of running them through an eight week design thinking process to try to reimagine and redesign how financing production and distribution works for indie film. Our theory of change here is potentially building a different game. Like I think they have successfully rigged this game. <laughs> I think we actually need to pick a new one. I, I don't think we can beat them at this game at this point because it's because the power is too consolidated. With my co-founders Liz Manischel, Abini Bloodworth, and Angela Harmon, we'd each been having conversations with filmmakers just sort of casually, individually about like, okay, what's next? How do we, what's the thing that's going to get us out of this horrendous situation? And, and like, how wild can we get? What can we imagine that no one's thought of before? And what we were consistently finding was there was such an imagination deficit um, in among filmmakers, like everybody was kind of spouting the same old ideas or, or just fe feeling completely trapped, like they couldn't see at all beyond what is or they like kind of wanted things to change, but then they were like, yeah, but Sundance. <laughs> and, I, and we were like, ah! So what we realized was that <laughs> there needed to be a process to simply expand people's imaginations so that we could begin to dream our way out of this. Because it seemed to us that people kept trying to fix indie film around the edges. But one of the things we discovered was it's a holistic ecosystem right now, and you actually can't just fix this thing or that. You have to, you have to redesign the entire ecosystem from financing through distribution. So the four of us then received training as design thinking facilitators or human centered design facilitators, which has been a very trendy process for the last 30 years in reimagining basically every other industry, except for some reason it's never been applied to film. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and so then we had a huge application process. We got we received applications from um, over 400 filmmakers um, and whittled it down to these 60. And then we're in the middle of designing this. And they're sort of prototyping, designing and prototyping new ecosystems. And there are 12. They've been divided into 12 design teams. And each design team has to design their own new ecosystem that has to address financing um, distribution and production. Is any one of these design teams going to come up with the absolute perfect solution for the entire ecosystem? Probably not. Hopefully, <laughs> that would be awesome, but probably not. But the idea is these filmmakers are going to take these ideas and apply them practically and experimentally to their own projects in the next couple of years. And we're going to have a knowledge database where they're going to be asked to report back on like, hey, we tried this financing idea that Team 5 had. This is what worked. This is what didn't. And we're going to invite anybody who comes to our presentation day or builds on our ideas to do the same thing. So that hopefully out like this, this summer will be the, the seed creation, but then hopefully over the next years as a community, we can iterate really fast through these ideas and into new ones by having a central repository of this, these learnings. So on August 15th, we're going to have a big presentation day, which we will invite members of the film community to invite everybody who applied to and also share out after the fact on social media and things. This is awesome. I, I think that's brilliant. I think it's just such a great idea to always be innovating like that. And there is no other industry that needs it more. Well, and, and I can't think of an industry where there's been so little innovation over the last three decades, not in terms of platforms. That's obviously iterating very quickly in terms of audience viewership platforms, but in terms of how indie films are actually financed, made and distributed. I mean, we're, we're like, still clinging onto the fumes of a 90s model that barely worked even then. I just had a conversation with uh, someone who was telling me how they had pre-sold their film. They were able to get the those uh, distribution deals in place before they even went into production. And of course, when I try and talk to the most readily accessible people in distribution, they'll tell you that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but that's because there's that conflict of interest, which is, they make more money when you know less. <laughs> totally. So I do feel like we're on the cusp of something that can bring on a new era of filmmakers. I mean, it has to. We've hit rock bottom. <laughs> we're like the addicts of a system. And COVID, I think, has actually accelerated the collapse, which I actually think is good in terms of our progression into the next thing, because it's just not working for 
anybody except like 10 people. Um, and the Duplass brothers are two of them. <laughs> like, it's just not, <laughs> yeah. not working. Right about now, you might be thinking, this all sounds so exhausting. Right. I just want to make well, my I, movies. I hear this a lot from filmmakers, and I particularly heard it a lot after the Joyful Vampire Tour. Because people would say, well, that's fine if you want to move into an RV for three months and whatever. But like, I just want to make my art. And my response to that is two things. A number one, I just want to make my art also. <laughs> However, we do not live in a system or a time where it is possible because I, I, I want to make my art again, too. So if I need if I need to make it again, I have to come up with some kind of sustainable way of doing that whether it's financially sustainable or coming up with a model where the financial sustainability doesn't matter, which so far I haven't done. So I actually have to be part of trying to figure that out. And secondly, I want to make art so that people will see it. <laughs> I actually don't care about making art just for myself. I want to tell stories to other people. And right now, again, we don't live in a time or live in a system where that will just occur naturally. Putting my, my time and my energy behind the distribution part is like almost more important than any place else because if nobody's seeing it, then who gives a shit? Like, what are we doing then? And this is a huge talking point or the core of your TED Talk, agent, How to Be an Agent of Change, which is art informs, informs our culture and the way to change the culture is to ensure that people see the art. Right. Okay and to for that art to be exemplary of the change we want to see. Right, right. And of course, my, so my third layered perspective, as you alluded to, is that I care very deeply about getting voices, no offense, that aren't white and male into the world. And right now, the systems don't do that. <laughs> they specifically do not do that. So again, if I care about that and I care about changing the world by getting these stories out there, I have to be part of figuring out the business of story as well. Films by, by and about women have been making money all the time. It's, it's a complete lie that they haven't been. Um, but also what you're saying is right. I mean, like, these are systems built by and for white guys. And so, of course, that's the content they continue to produce. And it's not an accident. That's how the system was designed. And they'll, they'll just tell us otherwise. They'll, they'll... Exactly. Right. Because it's uncomfortable to say, no, actually, we just really want to keep making these Terminator movies or whatever. <laughs> rather than acknowledging that actually these other films do make money and they just don't want to make them. I'd love to go on a uh, tangent about how uh, the systemic problems of, of the system are changing Netflix. You know, at some point we felt that Netflix was going to be a bastion for indie film, but... Right. Uh, well, I mean, Netflix completely threw us under the bus because <laughs> they built their... what I mean, the way my perspective on this is they built their brand on indie film because they couldn't get the bigger films. And once they built their wealth and their power on indie film, and they could get those other films, they threw us under the bus. <laughs> and then they destroyed our business model because they moved the film industry from a democratic revenue model to an undemocratic revenue model. Because even five years ago, there was a much greater relationship between how many people had watched a film and how much money you were making, right? Because the number of people who buy a ticket to see your film has some relationship to how much money you make. Doesn't mean there weren't middlemen, doesn't mean there weren't these other problems, but there was like a direct correlation between sales and profit. <laughs> and even with TVOD, there was a re relationship between sales and profit. You know, the number of people who rented your film on iTunes mattered in terms of how much you made. But one of the main reasons that what I was describing about the, the 51 fund conundrum is true about how we know before a film gets made if it's going to make money is that now the only thing that determines the value of a film is how shiny the industry has decided it is. Because based on that metric, Netflix sets the sales price. And so if you have a film that the industry has decided is shiny, well, Netflix or somebody is going to buy it for an appropriate amount of money. But if it's a film that they haven't, Netflix is going to say, you know, we want your film for $10,000 for the next two years. We'll license your film for $10,000 for the next two years. You can try to negotiate, but you're an indie filmmaker and they're Netflix, so you can't really negotiate. So you're going to say, okay, yes, I'd like my $10,000. And then your film could become the biggest thing that Netflix has ever had. More people could see it than have ever watched any movie. But you won't know that because they won't tell you that. And in two years, they'll come back to you and they say, well, we'd like to license it again for $10,000. And you can say yes and you can say no, and it doesn't matter. So they've fundamentally delinked 
viewership with profit, which is very bad news <laughs> for indie film. There's like six guys that get to decide what everyone watches now. Yeah. And one of those guys is an algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> At least one. Yeah. <laughs> Which is also, I've heard some great conversations about as we let algorithms continue to decide what sort of content gets made or what sort of films get made, we're just going to create this feedback loop where we are just giving people what they want and crave rather than what they need and new. Yeah, the way I talk about this is that we're in a fast food era of content. So Netflix is basically McDonald's. They don't care if what they're making is quality or not. The only thing they care about is getting exactly the right chemical profile so that to keep you addicted, so that you never turn off Netflix. And somehow we have to basically do the content equivalent of the Whole Foods movement. <laughs> we have to remind people that there's a reason they actually feel sick because what the content they're consuming has no emotional value. And that actually story fulfills this really important societal need. And we're not getting that right now. And that actually people are going to have to make different decisions that might be more expensive for them in order to get something else. I love that fast food, we need to be thinking about the Whole Foods version of this. And honestly, that example is what gives me the most hope that change is possible here. Because in the 90s, there was a time where it really looked like we would never get people off fast food because it was cheap, it was easy, and it was chemically constructed, <laughs> right, to keep us hooked. There's a real equivalency there. And of course, some people still eat fast food, but, but these fast food chains now have salads. We were able to get enough people to understand, oh, we need farmers markets. Oh, actually, these foods are making sick. There are still food deserts, but that but there's at least a recognition that there shouldn't be and that we're trying to make changes. And so I it's possible. It's it's not going to be easy, but it's possible. The other thing I think that's related to this is that I think films have to be less expensive to make. I'm not confident that there is a model that will sustain true independent voices at the price point. And I think there's a really thing that, interesting thing that happened during COVID and also as a result of like TikTok, which is that people are now really used to consuming content that has a lower production value. Like after watching Jimmy Kimmel in his sweatshirt for in his house for a year, you know, I, I think there's a real shift that took place. And so I'm very interested in what could that mean in terms of bringing the cost of film down to a more sustainable price point. Yeah, I think I think that's a really uh, great perspective on sort of like a, a new look at what pay to play is like film has all it's you've had to pay to have a perspective basically there's a uh that barrier to entry is uh at least a million dollars you know probably 10 million dollars to have an opinion essentially yeah. but yeah looking at that that's a great benefit of people consuming more via their phones we have the opportunity if we can find that price point if we can lower that more people can have opinions we can have broader opinions well and i think most story industries, if publishing books are have been dominated by white men, as most of everything has in the West, but nowhere are the percentages as bad as film in no other story and media or story industry. And it's because of that price point, because the barrier to entry, because you have to be chosen before you can make your thing. And I think it's the reason that women and people of color have had better success in publishing is that you can sit, anybody can sit down and write a book. Now, of course, there are still barriers of entry, but at least you, you've you made the piece of art before you have to contend with that system. Um, and I do think somehow we have to figure out how to lower that gate. Well, and I think film schools are largely contributing to the continuing mythology of like, you'll make a film and then Sundance will play it and then a distributor will take it and make all of your dreams come true. Yeah, it actually, it actually even plays to uh, what you're talking about is you have films that are ordained by the system. Uh, you have film schools that are, are ordained by the system and then you have all these other schools that want to be like the ordained ones and they themselves don't realize you have to be ordained. Totally. Because as you said so brilliantly earlier, because there are people who make money off us having less information. <laughs> I think, I believe with Constellation and what you're doing, we'll be able to uh, change that. I, th I hope so too. I think so. Demystified is a production of StudioFest. 
If you're ready to make a micro-budget feature, submit your film or screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. Demystified is a Studio Fest production presented by Movie Maker. This episode was narrated and edited by me, Jake Bowen. It was conceived and recorded by Jess Jacklin, Charles Beale, and Jake Bowen. The theme song was composed by Patrick Patrikios. Other tracks used under Creative Commons licenses. To hear future episodes of Demystified, go to moviemaker.com or visit studiofest.com, where you can also learn more about Studio Fest and subscribe to the show.